Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Rights here on Depictions Media Radio. In this next segment, what we're going to hear is about indigenous rights. Um, and it is was recorded from a United Nations press conference. Now, it, I want to point out something very interesting about about this particular press conference because a lot of the press conferences that happen there, that they get a bunch of the... National press and a lot of the a lot of those reporters show up to actually be part of the press conference to ask questions and things. In in this particular case, while we were able to grab it from off of the um, Indigenous or First Nations uh, uh, a channel, that. Um, there were no other big um, national, uh, international press people there that they did not show up or, or they did simply didn't ask any questions, uh, which is kind of interesting. It means that that what happens with the indigenous people in the U.S. and Canada is not news how these people are treated by the US and Canadian governments in this particular case we're going to it's going to be more focused on the Canadian government because these nations were from uh, Canada that it these issues aren't important to enough to be broadcast as news or they should be glossed over as not being newsworthy and they are newsworthy what happens to any particular group's rights is newsworthy and should be broadcasted thus why we are putting this information out there they they're going to talk about colonialism and we have said time and time again on this particular show that colonialism is the root cause to a lot of hate crimes. That that attitude about, well, this is our land and you don't belong here because our forefathers uh, settled here. And they, and they grew it to what we see now. Well, the thing of it is in... The cases of indigenous rights, their forefathers were the were the colonialized forefathers. They stole the land away from the forefathers who are already here, or in this particular case, because this is one of the colonial um, attitudes is that. There should be a patriarchal system, meaning that men are totally in control, where the indigenous way is more of that it should be the women who are more in control of the uh, of 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 the civilized natures, the governments, and how. Um, the culture is spread and nurtured. 
culture should be nurtured. So, the matriarchal system that was in place by the original nations or the indigenous nations that were here in North America before colonialism has been replaced by a patriarchal system and that again leading us back to some of the root causes of the hate crimes and the genocide that have been placed against the the first nations or indigenous nations people in the US, United States and Canada. So, why don't we listen to what was said during the press conference and we'll be back. This one's for me when I sit down. But the other one's for me. Yeah. Just grab a seat, except for the first one. Yeah, any of the other seats. Oh, yeah, that's good. Right. You can put it here if you want to. Nobody's going to walk this way. Do I wear? Yeah, wear. Yes. Okay. Go on, okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Watching this way. Roseanne Archibald, the Tishnagas, and Dakota Dagamo, Shikata Dakoichian. Uh, hi, everyone. Welcome to our press conference. First, I want to just uh, say miigwech, thank you to the Permanent Mission of Canada, who are sponsoring our press conference today. Uh, in Cree, I just said uh, greetings and my name and where I'm from. I am the National Chief of the Assembly of First Nations and, of course, the first woman to be elected to this position. I, first of all, I want to just say miigwechdin and askamun for the inspiring leaders who are joining me in the front row today. Before I introduce them, I want to always acknowledge the Creator, the world around us, and our place within it, and to uh, say miigwech to the Lenape peoples uh, for hosting us on their beautiful territory. Welcome and thank you uh, for joining us at this 22nd session of the United um, Nations Permanent Forum, Forum on Indigenous Issues. Uh, we welcome you to today's uh, press briefing and the purpose of, our, of holding this press conference is for First Nations to talk about their priorities and what has uh, driven us from our home fires all the way here to New York City to this global forum this week. To my left are Chief Joe Alphonse, uh, who is the uh, Chakotan National Chief. Um, beside him is Vice Chief Ali Bear from the Federation of uh, Indigenous Sovereign Nations. And uh, to the left of her is former Cook P. Judy Wilson, and also a part of our Canadian delegation, and of course, uh, Grand, Ch Grand Council Chief Reg Nikanabe uh, from the Anishinaabek Nation. Uh, in the front row, we have uh, Chief Norman, Ch Chief Norma Cataract, not Norman, uh, 
uh, from Buffalo River Dene Nation. Uh, we also have Haley Rose, uh, one of the youth. Uh, and over there I see Taylor, uh, Takosha Ben, um, and Ashley Daniels, who are on the AFN uh, Youth Council. So we have what we call an international panel to honor this international indigenous forum. Each First Nation is unique. And if you're looking for uniformity, you won't find it. However, you will find that we are united in our support of one another and the indivisible common vision that we share, which is happy, healthy children surrounded by the love and care of their families living in safe and vibrant communities. And that, that vision starts with ensuring that Indigenous women and girls are, and two-spirited, are loved, cherished, safe, protected, and treated with dignity and respect always. As First Nations at this Un United Nations Permanent Forum, we're taking the microphone to amplify our priorities of decolonizing, decarbonizing, and calling out the systems that undermine and harm Mother Earth and our mother tongue and matriarchy. Internationally, we must take a families first approach to the crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and 2S plus. And I've asked Judy Wilson to be uh, that voice for her family and for all families. We did hear Deb Halland at the beginning of this forum say, if we don't empower our women, our climate goals won't succeed. And I would add that we must also empower our youth uh, who are sitting with us today. Uh, youth are often called the leaders of tomorrow, but everyone knows that I always call them the leaders today. So at last year's forum, I requested the Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to come to Canada to investigate violations of Indigenous rights in our in Turtle Island. And I wanted to thank him for traveling to us last month. And I was happy to be sitting in the plenary with him this morning. I look forward to his findings and recommendations this Friday, and ultimately his report to the United Nations Human Rights Council in September. And that's why these forums are so important. It's uh, a way for all Indigenous people across the world uh, to connect and to work together on common goals. So now I'd like to invite my fellow panelists to highlight the issues that bring them to this year's United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. Miigwech for listening. So we'll start with Chief Joe Alphonse. Jani Dil Nani Lava Hai Dil Jikaini Tan Jan Kaini Nan Jat Yat Hal Tik One acknowledging the lands that we we are on Not sure what the nation Lenape people You know we hope to leave this area and not have any negative effect on their territories It's customary that we always uh, get permission from those nations before we travel their territories and stuff. So to do business on their land is, we have to acknowledge at the very least. So I'm here, I'm I'm tribal chair for the uh, Tsaikoti National Government. Uh, we are um, 2014, one Aboriginal right and title case in Canada. The only First Nation to win Aboriginal title. We have uh, 1,800 square kilometers that's all owned by Tsaikotin people. You know, reserve lands and all that territories we always say is ours, but there's nothing that's actually 100% owned. Canada and BC don't have jurisdiction on those lands we do and stuff. And it's to tell that story, to tell that journey, to share that with other Indigenous people, regardless of what country they come from, to inspire, to 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 bring hope. It's a lonely place when you stand, when you stand up for your rights. 
we fought the Seco mine, which would have been the largest copper and gold mine in North America as part of that journey. It was a big part of our fight against the wind tidal. How many times we stood there, we were told there's no way you guys can beat them. You got pro government, Canada government, Stephen Harper government. You got pro provincial government, Gordon Campbell government. You guys have no chance. There's always a chance. Saiskotin people, we're Diné people, we're our role is to travel before the other Dene's and obtain land. We're a warlike people, we love a fight. Doesn't matter if we win or lose, as long as we're fighting, we're happy. Even if we have no chance, <coughs> we have a fight. And if we lose that fight, we will come back. We will re strategize study our enemy and we will come back twice as hard. That's the way it's been with the Tzaytlkwati. Twice we beat them. When everybody else says we, there was no hope, so we signed a business deal. We don't believe in that. Whatever you believe, you stand behind it 100%. And to stand there, often we had to stand there alone, feeling alone. Nobody would everybody would tell us how foolish we are to win Aboriginal title on the eve of our court case. Every Aboriginal organization, every Aboriginal lawyer in Canada told us you have no chance of winning. Withdraw your case. Withdraw your case. We reminded them 1864, the conclusion of the Chilcotin War, six of our war chiefs were executed but in today's day and age, if we lose that case, we just lose it. We don't get executed. So what are you guys afraid of? We lose, we'll go back, we'll re strategize we'll come back. This is what it means to be Chilcotin. In our world, we're only here for a short time. When you guys cross over, there's going to be six chiefs waiting on the other side. You explain to them why you withdrew when they paid the ultimate price to protect our culture and our way. So we said we will move forward. And we didn't have a lot of friends when we said we were going to move forward. But suddenly everybody was our best friend when that court decision came down. We said... It's not whether we win or lose. We have done everything we can in our power. The only thing left is for that courtroom up there to finally look at us and actually acknowledge us as human beings. That's what this case is about. And it's to stand up, stand up for yourself, stand up for your family. We want a better quality of life you look at statistics all across Canada, it's all. And for our win in the Chilcotin War, we were declared war on white people in 1864. And what led to that was the final straws when they took our head war chief's daughter and they used her for entertainment. And they abused her. The Chilcotins declared war on them. And I thank our... our our mothers in winning that Aboriginal title. You can change all of the Chilcotin chiefs every month if you want, but the position of the Chilcotin will always stay the same because our mothers and their teachings to all of our children. The first thing we learn as Chilcotin is that under a flag of truce, we went in to talk peace and the jumped our war chiefs and took them and tried them as murderers and executed them. And because of those teachings, teachings by our women, our mothers, it's the reason why we won our case. So I'll, I'll leave it there. I, we got some other members on the board here. And 
I don't want to take too much more of our time. Thank you very much, Chief Joe. Um, and Vice Chief Ali Bear. A petty wash day, a two e Ohana, a chia pita tonka ska, we a makia paye wa paha ska o yate to Hawahi. Good day. My name is Tatanka Skawi. My English name is Ali Bear. I'm the third vice chief of the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, and I am honored and proud to represent the 74 nations in the Saskatchewan region in Canada. Um, I'm from Wapahaska Oyate, which is White Cap Dakota First Nation, and I'm a proud Dakota Wean. And I'm honored to be here today with each and every single one of you. Um, as a young leader, um, I know I have a lot of ways to go and a lot to learn still. So it's a huge honor to be able to sit here and to speak to these issues. But also from a younger perspective, you know, first and foremost, I'm a mother. And I have two daughters that have to grow up in this society. And this society right now is targeting our women and our girls and our two-spirited plus. And we need to be doing more to protect them. We need to be making sure that these issues are at the forefront because they continue to get overlooked and we continue to see more women go missing and murdered. Right now, currently, in Canada, we do have the MMIW inquiry from 2019 and the 231 calls to justice that need to be implemented because we continue to see an increase of our Indigenous women being murdered, especially the latest case, Linda Beardy in Winnipeg, who was just recently found in a landfill. We are not trash. We are not garbage. We deserve to be valued. Uh, traditionally, our women held high respect in our communities. And is that colonial violence that came here, that colonial mindset that came here and you know put us to the lowest of the hierarchy. And now we're, re re we're regaining that power. We're regaining that leadership as we see national chief here as the first woman national chief. And we see a lot more women chiefs standing up and stepping up. Chief Norma Cataract here a strong Dene leader of her nation. And I'm very honored to be here with her today. Our youth chief, Haley Rose. We need to continue to protect each other. And we need to make sure that we are calling on all levels of government to take this issue seriously. Because we need to put it into it. And this is not just an indigenous issue. This is everyone's issue. Everybody in society should be protecting one another and our future generations and our children. And I say that and I ask that and I call upon all levels of government as a mother, as a lawyer, and as the third vice chief of the FSIN. Padame A. Matakawas. Uh, chief Bear. Uh, Judy. I also want to acknowledge the Lenape people of the land here and also all of our women and youth here and the ones that are will be listening in around the world uh, because this is the place we gather at the United Nations to be able to share our voices and share our space so I'm very honored to share the space here and thank you National Chief for creating this space I think uh, our leadership when they create the space we can amplify those issues as you heard from our Chilcotin Nation and uh, from Ali here, uh, the Vice Chief, um, of all the issues that we're going through. So despite <clears throat> its commitments, Canada continues to breach and violate the principles and standards affirmed in the UN Declaration. Our country is just having legislation to implement it uh, through an action plan, but Canada continues to deny the existence of Indigenous title and treaty rights, uh, inherent title and treaty rights, which our nations have never ceded, surrendered, or sold, despite having been forcibly displaced from our homelands and regulated to reserves that uh, total to 0 0.02 of the Canadian land mass. And so when Chief Joe was talking about how they took our land, they forced us on reserves, and they didn't recognize or are still refusing to recognize our territorial lands. And the Chilcotin people have been having the uh, long time in courts uh, across the country in securing their title for their land. So the assumption that the Crown title to the 99.8% of our territory land is very the very dispossession that the United Nations condemns. Uh, do, they do not, we do not even hold title to our reserves. Uh, people don't realize that we're still wards of the government and we don't hold title to our reserves. That's the other uh, thing. I think we raised that in the AFORD report to the federal government. And our people are still wards, and we still have our uh, programs and services, so our 
all of our wealth is taken from our land and it comes back to us in forms of programs and services that impoverish us. So you hear many chiefs talk about that where I'm just managing poverty on our lands. So when the uh, title and rights of, of the Indigenous people are perceived to be in conflict with the assumed national interest or the agenda or priorities of Crown government that often align with corporate interests, uh, the title and rights of Indigenous peoples are repeatedly infringed and violated. So we can see that continually over and over. You probably heard a lot of that <clears throat> today uh, when we're in the assembly with the in Indigenous peoples, rapporteur of Indigenous people. Some of those core issues, when we talk about we're still under that colonial blanket, it's a colonial framework that we're under. And it's really the section two, two of the rights of Indigenous peoples and the Common Law Interpretation Act on 35.1 relies heavily on the doctrine of uh, discovery. And that's when we're saying repudiate the, the doctrine of discovery and the Pope repudiated it, but there's a lot of the work in dismantling it and revoking it in law uh, because the courts and the legislation and the government still rely on that uh, framework. So it, which negatively impacts us on our day-to-day -day life of, as, as Indigenous people and nations. It includes the imposition of Crown sovereignty over Indigenous lands, including the self-government rights and its disregarding Indigenous laws and legal traditions. Many of ours are still intact because our lands are still intact. We still hold those Indigenous laws and legal orders and jurisdiction. And establishing that the Crown has uh, the has that ultimate title to the land, that's what we're pushing back on. That's what we're saying, no, they don't. They have something called assumed uh, title and jurisdiction. They, they never, we never consented to it. They never conquered us. They never see us. We didn't surrender to them. So the burden, however, uh, the burden of proof is imposed on our Indigenous peoples and nations to establish their rights in courts. And I, I can't fathom how long uh, Chief Joe's been at this and the cost of it. You know, it's a burden was placed on their nation. That, that's not right. And they, I know they're very strong and they will continue that. We've supported them in the courts and will continue to support this work. And the, uh, the other racist notion is the frozen in time. Uh, the Vander uh, Peet legal test for establishing our, our Aboriginal rights. We're constantly fighting that with fisheries. We're constantly fighting that over our rights and our resources and the land. So that, that's the other thing. And the ability uh, for the Crown to infringe Aboriginal rights based on the Sparrow uh, legal test, uh, so the justifications for infringing. Uh, Canada got a national pipeline and, and it, then they're infringing coming through our territory uh, without our consent. So there's like all kinds of examples uh, of these different infringements. And the erosion of the government's duty to consult and accommodate to nothing more than procedurally right that is uh, reviewable based on administration and law principles. So that's the other uh, part is the consultation. Now it should be free prior informed consent, which was uh, something we're going to have to move the bar on. I wanted to touch on something Ali touched on was the Indigenous women and communities in Canada are facing a crisis. You know, the... Um, I was just at the NWAC uh, uh, side event on missing murdered women and climate change. So, you know, uh, some of the provinces were noting the the statistics, and they're similar all across Canada that our women are missing and murdered and, and our two-spirit and diverse gender. And our men and boys, too, they're almost like almost getting to be at almost the same amounts now, which is, you know, against our Indigenous people. So they're, um, especially when they're land protectors or water protectors, you know, they're, they're even uh, more uh, vulnerable and more attacked, especially when they're uh, in vulnerable states like in downtown Eastside or Winnipeg or Manitoba or Ottawa. Uh, we've seen that firsthand when we're in Ottawa just a few weeks ago for our, our special chiefs assembly, how our marginalized our, our women are and, you know, the impacts that our women have uh, that they're going through. But we, we, we did have recommendations many, many years ago for the uh, UN uh, Permanent Forum, 
you know, we wanted to, to include the Indigenous lands, territory, and resources, you know, as a standing agenda in, in, uh, in the forum. We wanted to be able to have a better uh, Indigenous coordinating uh, body, which I just came from the Chilcotin and supported that. Uh, they were just uh, having their uh, hosted meeting across the street there. There's still a lot of changes that we have to do, but we have to be involved in these mechanisms. And, uh, you know, a large part I spend on climate uh, and environment and uh, missing murdered women. But, the, you know, they're all connected. All of it's connected. That's why, you know, we have to ha have the equal opportunities to have these spaces to be able to speak on these different issues. But because it, it is about our self-determination, it is about the nations deciding, you know, uh, what avenues they're going to go. It isn't Canada's determination. Uh, we're not under Canada. We're our own nations. The self-determination has to be driven by our nations. Uh, Cooks, Chairman, thank you. Thank you so much, Judy. And our final speaker is Grand Council Chief Rajnikanabe. <laughs> Miigwech National Chief for your invitation today is much appreciated and good afternoon to everybody. Uh, my name is Reginald Niganabi from Mississauga First Nation. And I'm part of the Sturgeon Clan and I'm an elected Grand Council Chief of the Anishinaabeg Nation. Yesterday, the Anishinaabeg Nation spoke at the thematic discussion about the issue of Line 5 in the Mackinac Strait, or the Mackinac Strait, sorry. Anishinaabe peoples are peoples of the Great Lakes Basin. Uh, the international border creates an artificial divide between our American and Canadian families. At the United Nations, we'll continue to seek clarity on the application of principles of free prior and informed consent when it comes to state actors and Indigenous peoples that do not live within their domestic jurisdiction. For example, Line 5 crosses through Wisconsin, Michigan, and then terminates in Ontario. Should Canada, as a signatory to UNDRIP, be informed about the need to ensure that ban indigenous bands in America must also be consulted in the creation, monitoring, and decommissioning of major, major energy projects. As many Anishinaabe have stated, Godwe Wangazid Anishinaabe, we are one Anishinaabe family, no matter if we are U.S. federally recognized tribes or Canadian Indian Act bands. I'd also like to highlight the ongoing situation in Thunder Bay, Ontario. With the over-policing and over-incarceration of our people, our two-spirited missing murdered Indigenous women and girls concerns, and the deaths of young Indigenous peoples in that community. There has been a number of expert reports presented that require a strong commitment to implementation to remedy the human rights situation, and we encourage the Government of Canada and the Province of Ontario to follow the direction given by those reports as we continue to monitor the situation and advocate for safer living conditions for our own Anishinaabe peoples and other Indigenous peoples in Thunder Bay. Additionally to that, policing remains a core issue for Indigenous peoples. And I'd like to highlight that the Ontario First Nations police chiefs have filed a complaint with the Canadian Human Rights Commission on the inequitable funding of Indigenous police services. We've seen the value of Indigenous police forces being run for and by the community. They are more responsive and understanding of intergenerational trauma and how that leads to more Indigenous peoples being in contact with the police. We at the Anishinaabeg Nation are also concerned with safeguarding Anishinaabeg sovereignty, possession, and jurisdiction over data, genomics, omics, and artificial intelligence. Current data practices both in force and draft legislation do not align with Anishinaabeg Nation sacred duty to protect, preserve, and ensure the well-being of the peoples of the seventh generation. We are worried that data priorities that weaponize data could create further dispossession at the expense of our inherent rights. With that, it is important to engage on this international stage to monitor how state actors will use novel or complex jurisdictions like data governance or the implementation of FPIC to push through agendas that serve corporations and not people. As Anishinaabe people, we worry that a lack of attention to the guidance and wisdom of Indigenous people will lead to more poor policies for human health and well-being. We are proud to stand alongside our international Indigenous brothers and sisters and call for a sustainable future based on Indigenous leadership. Miigwech. 
Thank you very much uh, to all of our speakers. Uh, we are told that we have, we're have we okay for time in terms of Q&A because there's nobody uh, coming after us, so really appreciate that. And understand it's customary for the first question to go to the UNCA, which is the United Nations Correspondents Association, so I'm not sure if one of them is in the room with the question. Uh, if not, we'll just open it up for uh, general questions. Oh, sorry, we need to get you a, a mic. Yeah. Yeah, the mic is on, on your side. There you go. Yeah, working for the French <laughs> News Agency, ISD. I just would like to ask you to elaborate a little more on the, on the situation of women. And, and on the other hand, here at the UN and this forum, you can see that uh, a lot of uh, leaders, women, are, are participating. Which is the situation in the in the in in your in your lands and and here? It's uh, just like it's a little contradiction, because um, could you? Well, I don't know if it's a contradiction, but I, I think it's it's like a a, a, a huge empower, empowerment of women in uh, in. Uh, in uh, among the, the the indigenous population, right? Can you explain? Thank you. Did you want a specific panelist or just generally? Okay. So uh, the question it, it's about if there's a contradiction because there's more indigenous women in leadership, but there's also missing and murdered indigenous women epidemic happening. Yeah, well, as, as I mentioned, traditionally Indigenous women have always been leaders in their communities. We have our matriarchs and so forth. But Indigenous women and our, our two-spirited uh, brothers and sisters have been targeted because of that respect and authority that we've always held in our communities. So for a very long time, that colonial um, ideology of a hierarchy and patriarchy and misogyny has also been embedded in our communities. As mentioned, the Indian Act, the Band Council system, something that we never consented to. We have treaty rights, we have inherent rights, but we've never had an implementation of a treaty act, or we, have, we actually had the Indian Act, which was incredibly racist and it actually created more harm. And that's where the Band Council system was implemented. And from that, that implemented a lot of those colonial ideologies. And so that's why we didn't have a lot of women in leadership for a very long time. And that's why we see a lot of lateral violence as well in our communities, because that comes from that colonial violence. And now we're dealing with colonial violence and lateral violence and harms on our peoples um, when it comes to missing and murdered indigenous people in general. And we see a, a rise in that. But now we see that traditional woman in leadership coming to the forefront at the same time. And that's why I think we're talking more about our missing and murdered indigenous sisters and two-spirited relatives. Because this has been overlooked for far too long. And we just had our first national gathering in Vancouver. And you know there was thousands of families. The FSIN serves 128 families in our province alone, and that's not even all the families for missing and murdered. We don't have any justice being served because the justice system is also racist. And then if those women were non-Indigenous women, I think this issue would be taken more seriously. And it's time for us to all take this issue more seriously to put it into it so that I, we can feel safe on our own land. So when we talk about, <clears throat> when we talk about a perspective from ma matriarchy or a perspective of life givers, and our role uh, that's essential in our families, but it's also essential in our governance structure, as was mentioned. Uh, we need to continue the traditional knowledge uh, to have that foundation, not just for ourselves, but our families, the community, and the nation. Uh, so with the disruption of the colonial cloak or the colonial framework, as we mentioned earlier, and the Indian Act, it displaced uh, that role and the Indian residential schools that removed our children broke down the families so the families were uh, they didn't what they, they they knew what they were doing they were 
not just taking the Indian out of the child, they were taking the entire family governance structure and the community and nation structure out when they did that. So they did it on purpose besides the language and the culture. So many of the nations now are re rebuilding or reconnecting, I guess is a better word in our world. Uh, it's uh, more stronger reconnecting with who we are, our teachings, our culture. Our, and one of the elders told me that sometimes even in our families we don't even know how to talk to each other anymore because of that whole colonial system. Uh, you know, the children weren't supposed to be heard from, the women were, you know, not being acknowledged or respected. So the violence continued uh, from residential school into the communities and a lot of that is being restructured. Even though with the Indian Act it's really hard because it's almost like a conditioning uh, in the community because they don't, they are trying to remember what who were we before that. So when we take go back on the land and we hunt and we fish and we harvest and get plants and medicines, there is that collective memory that comes back of who we are as a nation, as a people, and how we need to have that balance and that harmony. So will the Indian Act structure survive? You know, I don't know. Uh, you know, it's, it's some nations are doing hybrid type things. Uh, I'm looking to the nations that are reconstituting themselves in the sense of reconnecting with the land and, and their governance systems. There are some in the nations that are doing that. Uh, and I always explain to our leadership not to be afraid of it. I said many of you are already spokespersons in your families. Uh, ideally, my older sister would be our spokesperson, our <laughs> Matriarchy. My mother is 86, so she's still the one that's in our, you know, calls all the shots, I guess. But, uh, you know, that I think our people had that system uh, 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 for a reason, right, and, and passed that on. Uh, a lot of our laws are based on coexistence uh, with uh, everything and interconnectedness. So I just wanted to say that and really support what Ali is saying about that structure because we, we're going into the whole implementation of the UN Declaration, but it doesn't mean we're implementing the colonial structure continually. We need to shift from that and protect our territories like, you know, what our nations here are talking about and, and rebuilding. I heard a lot of great words from our chiefs here uh, that how they're talking about doing that and that's the the where we need the resources and the funding and the government to quit taking us to court when we're standing up for our own land, our own water and our own people. Uh, thank you both for that. I do just want to add one more thing to this conversation. As the first woman national chief, these spaces are particularly difficult for women, especially at this juncture, and being the first is always uh, a really difficult place to be. And so we're seeing the resurgence of matriarchy and the respect of matriarchy happening, but we're not to the place of gender equality or gender parity in leadership. Women are half the population, yet right now I think we stand at about 24% of chiefs across Canada. So we still have quite a ways to go. But what's interesting about this question is that, you know, we are bringing forward those issues that um, have not been discussed in the past. And this is the second United Nations forum where I have spoken about missing and murdered indigenous women and girls. And, and so what's important about this issue is that there are families that are affected directly. And those families need a space internationally. And that's why I had asked uh, former Cook P. Judy Wilson to be the voice of not only her family, but to let other family, families know that there's a space for them here. But last October, the Commission on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women released the general recommendation on the rights of Indigenous women and girls. And so this is a, a, a historic, I would say, um, human rights document. Uh, providing legally binding recommendations, uh, obligations to governments around the world. So we're calling on uh, governments everywhere, all this, the nation states uh, that belong to the UN, to make sure that this recommendation is implemented. 
and it's very much connected to the work that we are, are trying to do in creating spaces for conversations about missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls and to us people. Now, um, I just want you to know that we do have some young people, our youth leaders here. Uh, so if there are questions, uh, we want to let you know that they're available to come up to the mic as well, because uh, it's not just about the panel at the front, but we know that our youth leaders have been doing great work here at the UN, uh, you know, facilitating, participating in many, many side sessions, and so, and leading some of them. So that's really important work. Uh, for the future um, as we move forward here at the UN and become more and more active and look toward um, a permanent mechanism, um, a permanent space for Indigenous women, which was called for today by uh, a representative from, I believe, Central America. So with that, um, I'll turn back and see if there are any questions in the room. And if not, I'll go to the online. I'm not sure if there are any people online who had their hands raised or had any questions. But anyone in the room? Chief? Yeah. Um, have you, you have to grab a, a mic. It's right beside you to the left. Sorry about that. Uh, you've all heard about carbon credits. What are your thoughts on carbon credits? Go ahead. Well, I think they're always inventing something more and more, more tenures, more credits, more, and that they can control. I know our um, elders say, how can you control water? How can you control the air? Well, you know, Mother Nature controls, or Creator controls that. So I think they're just coming always up with more things they can trade to pollute more uh, and contaminate more and justify more what they're doing. So if we take the carbon credits uh, from the Amazon or another country, oh, I can pollute more over here. So it's not really uh, a fair process. I think it's just like a more mathematical numbers uh, to use. So I think it's our jurisdiction, our laws, and our ways of knowing that at the end of the day uh, are going to be what we need to be leading with. I know one of the chiefs in our area one time when he first was hearing about climate uh, crisis will change at that time um, and the Arctic people were telling us it's already here. Uh, he was saying, well, how do we control that in our territory that, that these uh, government and state uh, and industry is doing? He said, maybe we should just have our laws already, you know, the, what we can't see, uh, the zero emissions in our territory. <laughs> So he said, that's what he told me anyway. But anyway, there's probably a more sophisticated way to answer that. But uh, I, I just was also asking our elders what it, what they thought about it. But they said, oh, just coming up with something else to trade to justify continued pollution, which we know needs to end because of the climate crisis. Go ahead, Chief, uh, Grand Chief, Grand Council Chief. Um, yeah, I view it as another way to pass off on exactly what she said another way to pass off on things that could be tangibly done right away uh, as I mentioned in our discussion the line 5 line 5 could effectively be shut down it was supposed to be shut uh, it's supposed to have a duration of 50 years it's well beyond the 50 years now it's 50 years plus another 15 years of operation plus plus however long they can keep it going uh, with a lot of their court challenges and everything else they're doing or the interference that Canada can run for them um, that's a tangible thing that they could do tomorrow. It wouldn't impact uh, very heavily on fuel or oil in any way, shape, or form. They can transfer it somewhere else if they really wanted to um, in other avenues of transferring it, but they choose to keep that line in operation for no reason at all. So, yeah, there's more effective resources that they could do or more effective things that they could do that they're not doing. Thank you. And thank you for the question. Any other questions in the room or online? There's one question. Or somebody has their hand up. Sorry, I'm looking at the technician <laughs> in the room. Maybe Andrew, you could uh, ask him. Okay, no no questions online. Okay, well, I don't see anybody else raising their hand in the room, so I want to again thank the panelists for participating and... 
um, as promised, we heard a lot about um, the murder and missing women uh, in in Canada. That these indigenous um, mothers and sisters have been stolen, and some. You heard one was found in a landfill, and the statement made that we are not trash or garbage. The the struggle comes down to this more than anything else is that that indigenous people are human beings and should be treated as human beings and not as something that could be just tossed away because it well that thing just didn't count to begin with that is the attitudes that were that brought about the the colonial system and the genocide attempts that came along with it so I want to thank you for listening today. You've been listening to Policy and Rights here on Depictions Media Radio. I've been your host, Michael Cloggs. And please do subscribe wherever you find the button to, to do so. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.